And John Seward commented several times that there were two Dharma themes that John Munn would repeat again and again in his Dharma talks. One was following the customs of the noble ones, and the other was to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. We can take these as the basic principles of the practice, the basic principles of the forest tradition, that we're not here to change the Dharma to suit our likes and dislikes. We're here to bend our likes in the directions of the Dharma as it is. In terms of practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, you may remember that this is mentioned in the Sutta, the Buddha's passing away. They said this is how you show respect for the Buddha, not with flowers and incense, but practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. He said as long as we do that, the world will not be empty of our hands. Because after all, that's what the teaching is all about. Making sure that the path to our hardship is open, the path to the end of suffering is open. We keep that path open by not changing it. And John Sawat again, he made a comment one time that when someone has reached the end of the path, as far as he's concerned, the path could grow up with weeds again. But then he looks back and he sees other people coming along the path. And he feels compassion. And then he sees other people, still, placing rocks and obstacles in the path. So he wants to clear those obstacles away. So the best way to keep the path open for the people who come after us, even if we haven't reached the end of the path ourselves, is to make sure that we don't make any changes in the path, send it off into the, the woods on either side of the path. We keep it going in the right direction. There's a passage where the Buddha defines what it means to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, and it's to practice for the sake of disenchantment. And through disenchantment to dispassion, through dispassion to release. The word for disenchantment, nibida, is also the word that's used when you've had enough of a certain food. This fits in with the the Buddha's teachings on clinging, because the word for clinging is to feed. We cling to form, we cling to feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness, which means we feed on them, hoping to get some satisfaction out of them. And the Buddha points out that it's that's why we're suffering. And so it wants us to get a sense of having had enough of this kind of feeding. And so having had enough that we gain release. This is why this is one of the tests of what actually is Dharma. You see there's all sorts of scholarly ad theories about how you can tell what's Dharma what's not Dharma by comparing the different versions of the canon that you find in the Pali canon and the Chinese canons and the Tibetan canons and whatnot. But just because something has made its way through the different canons doesn't mean it necessarily is Dharma, or that something is found only in one canon and not in the others. That doesn't mean it's not Dharma. As the Buddha said, the way you test it has nothing to do with who said it, but it's when you put it into practice and what, see what results you get. And those principles he gave to his stepmother as to what counts as dharma and what doesn't count as dharma. There are two that are related to the goal of the practice, which are that you become dispassionate and you become unfettered. But you develop dispassion for the way you've been feeding. You decide that you've had enough of this. It's not worth it. That's when you let go. When, we let, when you let go, you're freed. This is why the Buddha used the image of the flame going out by the attainment of the coal. Because in those days they believed that fire 
when it was lit, was clinging to its fuel, was feeding on its fuel. And the way to get the fire to go out was to get the fire to let go. In other words, the fuel is not holding on to the fire. The fire is trapped because it's holding on. In the same way our minds are trapped by sight, sound, smells, taste, and tactile sensations. Not because of those things. They're not trapping us. We're the ones trapping ourselves. Which is why we have to be especially careful about not changing the Dharma to fit in with our preconceived notions. Because our preconceived notions, for the most part, tend to have feeding as their purpose. We want to keep on feeding on sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensations. Anything that gets in the way, we want to change. We have to admit that okay, we've been making a mistake. We're feeding on the wrong things, looking for happiness in the wrong way. So maybe we should listen to the Buddha and see what he, hear what he has to say. So you look at the life of John Munn. He made himself into Dharma. It wasn't that he chose that he liked this teaching or didn't like that teaching. He would submit himself. And the word submit is important here. You take these things on. You take them on to test them, but you give them a fair test. Some people test things. I've heard many people say, well, I meditated and didn't do anything for me, so there must be something wrong with meditation. Well, they meditated once or twice. Or even if they meditated for a long time, they didn't submit themselves to what was genuinely the drama. And so they're in no position to come to a fair judgment as to what works and what doesn't work. You really have to look at what the Dharma has to say and put it into practice. Does it lead to dispassion? Does it lead to being unfettered? That's the Dharma. And in testing the Dharma, you're also testing yourself. Are you honest in the way you conduct the test? Are you fair? Have you really put in the effort? This is the Buddha promised. It's going to take effort. He says there, those whose practice is easy and fast, those whose practice is easy and slow. Those whose practice is difficult and fast, and those whose practice is difficult and slow. And you can't choose beforehand. So I think I'd like the easy and fast, or I'd like the easy and slow. If it turns out your practice is going to have to be difficult, okay, be willing to put up with the difficulties. Because we are dealing with the question of true happiness here. The Buddha is making the claim that he found true happiness through his own efforts. And part of his claim was that it came through developing qualities like ardency, resolution, heedfulness, things that we all have to some extent but things that we can all develop. So the implication is that we too can follow that path. We too can put it into suffering. We live in a world where that possibility is open. So we don't want to close off the door by saying, well, I'm not going to try, or I don't believe in it, or I don't think it can work. You look at yourself and you ask yourself, have you suffered enough? How much more do you want to suffer before you're ready to try the way out? Because this is it. This is the way out. So this is what it means to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. Practice for the sake of disenchantment, for the sake of dispassion. And that's how we test what the Dharma is, how, that's how we test ourselves. And it's a good test.
It doesn't involve doing anything demeaning. It doesn't involve anything at all that's less than honorable. Which is why the Buddha said that's admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. It's good all the way through. 